So, um, I'm very glad to be here today in uh, Texas. Though I visited about 30 states in the US in the past 15 years, it's the first time I am in the great state of Texas, so I'm very happy about, uh, about that. Um, as Brian just said before, we are going to have three half days, which I hope are going to help us uh, collectively get into uh, two key questions. Which kind of crisis the world is exactly facing right now? And what does mean EU-US relationship within this crisis? Uh, at this stage, and this uh, as being the first speaker for the, for the three, two days and a half, uh, one day and a half, I would like to focus on uh, one single issue, not specifically the European perspective, but what is exactly this global crisis we are, having, we are seeing? What kind of a crisis? What kind of uh, momentum, what kind of strength it has? To give an example, um, just uh, two days ago, we were in Galveston, and we have seen the exhibition on the Great Storm, which uh, it, uh, Galveston, I think it was nine, 901 or 1901. Yeah. And uh, looking at it, very nice, very, very well done uh, explanation with pictures and, uh, and uh, these little movies they show uh, in this exhibition. It strikes me that it was exactly giving the best image I could find about this global crisis, a topic on which I'm working since now uh, five years and a half with LEAP. Uh, I remember you that early 2006, nobody was even thinking. There was something called a global crisis coming. And when you look at the Galveston images, what do you see? You have this story, and they explain that at first, people were finding it funny. These waves, this wind, and you see these little drawings or images of uh, kids playing in, the, I don't know, 10 centimeters of water and having fun with it, and the families going on the seaside and looking at the big waves coming and so on. Then, a few hours later, they were stuck in their houses and being starting to be afraid because the waves were much bigger than they expected, but still not absolutely conscious that it will be uh, so destructive. So afraid, but not frightened. And then, of course, a few hours later, this was a disaster, and the town was completely uh, destroyed by those waves. Then, after the disaster, the municipality and people of Galveston decided that it should not be once again, and they build this huge wall and uh, put the city on, uh, uh, increase the heights of the city by building this slope from the wall and so on in order to protect the city for the future. And as far as I know, it has been pretty efficient uh, in the following decades. And I think this is giving a very good image of where we stand. In 2008, people were hit by something but still thinking it was, I would say, a normal crisis. A crisis like the world has known several of them in the past uh, 50 years. Something like a usual stock exchange or financial crisis. And essentially, families could keep on going and uh, kids playing a bit in the, in the turmoil and so on. And we are now, three years later. And there is something new. There is fear all over the world and in particular in the Western world. There is fear because people are realizing suddenly that this crisis has not succeeded and that it has come stronger, so that the early feeling that the waves will be small and will disappear very fast has now given place to the fact that the waves are going to be and are bigger, stronger, more dangerous, and that nobody is seeing when they will stop. So we are at the situation if I take again the image of Galveston, of when the families start to move into their house and look with some fear at what's going on outside. But by saying that, I also mean that we have still not seen the third phase. And the third phase is coming much faster than people may think. One of the characteristics of a crisis, an historical crisis, is that it is compressing time. Suddenly, things which normally take decades to happen, happens in a matter of months or quarters. That's the very sense in terms of time or what is a crisis. It is compressing time, which means that many things people think impossible or at least impossible in a short time becomes suddenly very possible. 
first thing to understand a crisis is to uh, display a certain sense of imagination. Without imagination, you cannot understand the big historical crisis. The second element of a crisis of this magnitude is to define which kind of magnitude it is. Like uh, the storm coming to Galveston. Is it a small storm, a big storm, a huge hurricane? Four or five in terms of strength and so on. And I think we can define this uh, global crisis as certainly a crisis like we only see something like this every four or five hundred years. I will give you examples, indicators, which are showing that. First indicator, the Bank of England, Central Bank of England, is the oldest central bank in the world. It was created in 1694. And it's the first time in the history of England, which has been quite uh, complex and uh, with ups and downs since 1694, it's the first time ever that the Bank of England was obliged to put its interest rate almost at zero, solo. Never, ever before, despite the wars, the internal fights, civil wars, and so on, and, and crises, the Great Depression, and whatever you can think of, uh, a lot of things happened in 400 years. Uh, never before, if you look at the chart, never, ever before, the chart went out of uh, the 400 years old uh, movement of the interest rates of the Bank of England. That is already showing that at least for a country like UK, which has been pretty central to the world history of the past uh, centuries, this, what happened since, three, uh, since 2008, is something that it has never experienced before in terms of financial and monetary issues. The second element, I will cross the channel and we go to France. France has a, a, the French state as a financial arm called la caisse des dépôts. It is used by the French state to, to have uh, its funds used for uh, uh, creating or managing or financing some uh, strategic priorities for the, the French uh, uh, government's interest. It was created uh, by Napoleon. So since the early 19th century, this Caisse des Dépôts, this institution, financial institution, never ever made a loss. But in 2009. So, as you know, French history of the past 200 years has been also full of uh, very complex and a uh, lot of up and downs uh, in many ways. Despite the wars, the occupation, and everything, never ever before had the Caisse des Dépôts made a loss in year. Again, the night, a loss. Third example. South from here, well, quite south from here, we have a country called Brazil. Brazil is very interesting when you look at its foreign trade. In the past 500 years, Brazil only had four different uh, countries as main trade partner. Of course, the first one was Portugal, colonial power. Then in the middle of the 19th century, say 1830 or 1840, it became UK. Then in the 1930s, it became the US. And since uh, two years, it's, yes, China. Again, you take a series of information indicators and you look, 500 years, four changes. That is showing each time, as you know, these dates were uh, reflecting a world leadership change. Another European example, recently, Germany used to have the US as a main trade partner outside of Europe, the main non-European trade partner, till last year when China took over. So I could multiply these kind of indicators, and I will not. What I want to show by that is that those indicators coming from different countries, different kind of fields, are showing the same thing. We are living, we are experiencing right now something which only happens once in several centuries. May, maybe three, maybe four, maybe I don't care. But not something you face any decades or two decades or five, any two or three or four centuries. And in fact, this crisis has one component which is not so new. The world after the crisis, which is the title of my book, uh, is not going to be only made of new things. It will also be made of old things which were coming from a time before the world 
was built and shaped up by Europeans and then Europeans and Americans uh, during the last 400 years. Till uh, the uh, colonial time started by the Europeans and then the Industrial Revolution, India and China used to be and to have and to represent 50% of uh, the world GDP as historian in economy has rebuilt it. And it's only since the 19th century that very fast, India and China part of world GDP started to collapse. And in fact, it reached the lowest level in the 60s, 1950s, 1960s, where it was less than 10%. And as you know, and especially now, with a very uh, rapid uh, and st uh, process, India and China, part of world GDP, are back rapidly, in fact, to what they used to be. Now it's about 30%, and I suppose that in a decade it will be not far from 50%. So what we are seeing, in many ways, is that this crisis also represents the end of a parenthesis. I will say the Western parenthesis, or the European, then Euro-American parenthesis, where for four centuries, the Europeans and then the, the Europeans and Ameri North Americans controlled a share of the world wealth, which was far bigger than their share of uh, population and so on, and which in fact was a complete exceptional uh, situation, historically speaking. So in many ways, this crisis is or will be seen from many continents, not as a negative thing, not as an abnormal thing, but as the things go back to normal. And that's something I want to stress. A global crisis is seen very differently from different parts of the world. Some will win, some will lose. So it's not necessarily only negative. A crisis is just a time of change. Point. That's the objective definition. What I hope I've passed through, at least for you to think of, is that I do believe that this crisis is an historical one in a way that it is changing the geopolitical structure of the world as some things like this only do once every few hundred years. What's the interest of knowing that? For our debate, of course, as Brian very rightfully uh, pointed out before, is essential. Because if we want to know what the US-EU relationship can be and do in the future, we need to know in which context. What are the forces which are unleashed in the world today? But also it has an interest for you as individuals, you as community leaders, you as uh, professors of universities, and so on and so on, or you as diplomats, as leaders, as advisors of uh, decision makers in companies or in uh, governments, and so on. If you don't know what you face, you cannot make any right decision. And part of the world problem of today Let's go back to the comparison with Galveston in 2008 and 2011, that you know very well, that nobody warned population that, in fact, the storm was getting stronger. Quite the contrary. For the past two years, till this summer, world leaders have been pretending that we were into a recovery mode, that the recession was over, that the good times basically were going to come back, and so on and so on. And they were wrong. Not necessarily because they are dishonest, some of them are. Not necessarily because they are stupid. Quite a few of them are. But because they just they don't understand what it was they were facing. Their advisors, which were not necessarily brighter or more honest, didn't know either. They were thinking in a framework, in a time frame of 50, 60 years. So their ultimate comparison was the Great Depression. Besides that, nothing could be imagined. Well, uh, bad luck. This was something much bigger, and Great Depression is not, in any case, an element of comparison. So what we can hope, and that's part of our work we do with LEAP and with the global impact we have with our monthly bulletin towards decision makers in, in public and private spheres and so on, and educators and, and uh, private citizens as well, is that we, we, we try, and I, I know that somehow we, we start to succeed, to uh, make the decision makers and the citizens aware that whether it's for their own sake uh, as individuals or their community's sake or their country's sake, they have to understand the magnitude and the nature of this crisis and to think that we are not going to see anything like coming back to normal, that we are not going to see the West 
whose core is the EU-US relationship, uh, is by definition the core of this West, will in, need, in no way come back to what used to be for in the last 50 years the situation. That, as Brian again was pointing out, that this emerging of new powers and so on are going definitely to make the world a much more complex world in which to operate. And, and that is really linked with our two days discussion, that the interests of the US on one side and the European Union, or what I will say more, the Euroland, but we'll talk about that later, uh, on the other side, may be more and more diverging, bless you, may be more and more diverging, because in this complex new situation, there are no reason that there will be a compulsory way that they will be together facing the same challenges with the same interest. Quite the contrary. And that is opening a big, big door on what can be and should be the transatlantic relationship of the next uh, decade. Thank you very much. <laughs>